Hey guys, it's Michelle, Leah, and Brandy, and this is Spooky Shit and Tales from the Beyond. So this week we are going to be talking about stories of people who escape death. Starting off with Brandy. And I'm going to talk about Mary Vincent. I'm going to be talking about Jennifer Absinson. Uh, Asbins, Asbinson? Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> Leah? Okay. And I'm going to be talking about the three Cleveland kidnapping survivors. Alrighty, Brandy, take it off. Woo! Oh, heads up, this is probably going to be a dark episode. <laughs> oh yeah, mine gets... I kind of left some parts out just to not be so graphic, but it's okay. still kind of graphic. Yeah. Um, so it might have been a long ass time ago, but it was so crazy that I had to like talk about it. <laughs> I was like, what? I actually found her story. I don't know if you guys remember that TV show called I Survived. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's where what I, got I was it. thinking of too. <laughs> whenever we were like talking about doing stuff, so I was like, like I survived. I was yeah. Thinking of, like mountain lion attacks and shit like that. <laughs> yes. Um, so Mary Vincent was only fifteen year old. Fifteen year old. <laughs> Killed it. Great start. <laughs> I hate myself. <laughs> Therapy. Mary Vincent was only fifteen years old when everything went down. She was a promising dancer and had actually performed front stage at the. I'm gonna pronounce this wrong. Lido de Paris in Las Vegas. Good enough. It might be Lido. I don't know. Probably Lido. Maybe. I don't know why, but I feel like it might be. <laughs> might be. Lita. Literally no reason for this. <laughs> um, I guess she also performed in Australia and Hawaii. Oh, shit. So she was very good. So she was like, yeah, she was. And well-traveled for 15. Mm-hmm. So you could say her future was looking bright. Yeah. <laughs> Until. Until. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but <laughs> on September 29th, 1978, she decided to run away from home. Oh. To Los Angeles. Well, there's actually differ- differing stories. Okay. Some say she was going to Los Angeles to try to, like, you know, everyone goes to Los Angeles to make, to, to make her career. <laughs> mm-hmm. Some say she was trying to go to Berkeley to her um, grandfather's house. Oh. One of those options is definitely more exciting than the other. Yeah, or I guess another one is they say she was trying to go back home to Las Vegas with her parents. Oh. So it's like differing. I'm like, it's I don't know. It's very confusing. It kind of is. They're all completely different stories. <laughs> yeah, but I guess she decided to leave home because her parents were actually going through a divorce and she just like, it was she messy. wanted some alone time. She wanted to get out of there. Yeah. And I just want to mention that back then it was like super normal to hitchhike. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Hell yeah. It was, <laughs> it was like the 70s no biggie. The 70s and hitchhiking, oh. Even mm-hmm. after the seventies, mine's yeah. in the nineties and involves some hitchhiking. Oh as shit! Well. A lot of these, a lot of our stories have involved hitchhiking. If you guys mm-hmm. <laughs> noticed, even yes, the hitch- that's true. <laughs> I was gonna say even the hitchhiking ghosts. I know. I was like, even the urban legends is hitchhiking. Yeah, <laughs> the paranormal basically. Side. So she didn't have any money. Oh, I wrote so a bunch of times. <laughs> she didn't have any money, so she hitchhiked along the freeway in the San Francisco Bay Area. Oh no! Along with two others. Oh, so she wasn't alone? Mm-mm. You think safety in numbers. Well, yeah. Oh, you're about to and so she, yeah. <laughs> so a blue van stopped and a man said he only had room for one of them. Okay. Mm-hmm. The man driving was 51-year-old Lawrence Singleton, who was a merchant seaman. I thought you were going to say, who was a murderer. <laughs> <laughs> So Mary decided to go with him despite the other two hitchhikers insisting she wait with them. Because they obviously got a bad vibe from him. They were like, because they were all going in the same direction. So they were like, why only one person? Were they all like teenage girls? No. Okay. Well, Well, I don't think it's specified. It just says two others. I was also wondering like, did he like look at three of them and be like, "Uh, youngest girl, (laughs) come with me. (laughs) No. She decided to go with him, and she told him that she wanted to travel on the Interstate 5, which he agreed to, but said he had to stop at his home in San Paolo. Oh, no. No. Why do you have to stop at home, dude? Can't just go to the gas station? No, we had to stop for some reason. And she she has to come in real quick. (laughs) (laughs) No, she didn't go in. Um, I guess they stopped by his house for some reason, and... While the, he was driving, he actually, like, reached over and tried to touch her. 
<gasps> like was touching her leg and she was like stop and what like obviously fuck? she was like no and she ended up like feeling around under the sea and found it's called a surveyor stick which is pretty much like this like plastic ruler but it's like it has a pointy end like a stake kind of kind of okay yeah with, but with like a ruler on it yeah <laughs> but basically it's like a stake a math stake and so she like pulls it out of the sea and is like yo like quit it and she ends up like scooting all the way to the door and ends up falling asleep oh <laughs> well i mean yeah she probably wasn't like too too scared she's probably like i got my stake i'm fine yeah basically <laughs> well and because he was just like if he was like an old man, she said like she went with him because he just seemed like nice, like a grandfather. Like, yeah, I was gonna say like a dad or yeah. a grandpa. And so she didn't really like see him too threatening. Mm -hmm. And so when she woke up, she realized they were heading in the wrong direction, going <sighs> towards Nevada, which is not, I'm guessing that's not where she was going. Yeah. <laughs> so she like was like, yo, what the fuck? Like, where are you going? And he was like, she was like, turn around. This is not like where I want to go. And I guess he was all, like, chill about it. He was like, oh, it's just an honor mistake. I'm an honest man. Like, and I guess he ended up turning around. Okay. That's um, a creepy-ass way to respond. Right? It almost is creepier that he also did turn around. And I'm like, well, what's going to happen next? <laughs> is he going to turn around again when she falls asleep? <laughs> no. It's just kind of creepy, though, like, that he was just, like, so, like, oh, I'm sorry. Ew. Like really trying to yeah. seem nice yeah. and trustworthy. You should, you should know that the five I five that only goes north and south, like it It only goes straight. Yeah, it only goes straight from like um I think it goes all the way to Oregon or something. And then all yeah, the way down to you know, the very tip of San Diego, all the way to like right before Mexico. So basically. It it's it the only way. freeway that we had in our hometown, so I know it just goes straight. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and there's no way you can mistake that. And actually go, go to Nevada. almost through, like, all of California. It does. Like, in no, a straight like all, shot. Like, literally. <laughs> yeah, a straight shot through. Accidentally started going to Nevada. <laughs> Awkward. Yeah. <laughs> Lawrence, Lawrence is a damn Made fool. a wrong turn. <laughs> uh, so, while on the road, he ended up pulling over because he said he had to relieve himself. Because he couldn't wait until they got to a gas station. Mm -hmm. So he pulled over and, like, went to go pee. Oh, relieve himself. I was like, what oh. do you mean? Relieve to go him. pee. pee, -pee. <laughs> I'm so nasty, bro. I thought you meant he was going to go, like, whack-a-mole. You know what I mean? Just say masturbate, Leah. Masturbate. Please never say whack-a-mole again. <laughs> Maybe that'll be the episode name. I thought he was going <laughs> to go relieve himself. Just a fun little game of whack-a-mole. <laughs> Anyways, she ended up getting out of the car, too, to stretch and um, tie her shoes, just because she, like, kind of had an uneasy feeling. She didn't want to be stuck in there? Yeah, basically. Like, if she needed to run away, she wanted to be ready, yes. basically. That's and so that... scary as a 15-year-old. What the fuck? Mm. It's just going to get really Every time here. that you go, mm, I'm like, Brandy. <laughs> it's about to go down. What's coming? <laughs> So as she bent down to tie her shoelaces, Lawrence hit her with his <gasps> fist and a hammer on the head oh. and back multiple times. Holy oh. shit. He then threw Mary into the back of his van where he tied her hands behind her back and proceeded to tear her clothes off. <gasps> and you can guess what he did next. Oh, poor baby. Yeah. So he ended up getting back into the driver's seat and drove for a while before stopping again. Where he raped and sodomized her again, <gasps> and so she Shit. ended she ended up like passing out just because he was like literally going and going. Oh my god, that's so traumatizing. Mm -hmm. She she passed out, and then when she woke up again, Lawrence was in the middle of dragging her about fifty yards or so away from the van. Oh my god! And during the whole time, like he had her tied up and stuff, like she just kept like begging, like let me go, like set me free, like please. You know, That's just pretty sad. much begging, and um, side note, real quick, anyone, if you hear background noises like little weird breathing or tip tapping, I am dog sitting for the day. I don't want you to hear that noise in the background of this very intense part and be like, <laughs> "What is this?" <laughs> He's a ghost. He's a ghost. It's just chunk. Uh, where was I? Oh, it's about to get even worse. Oh no. Okay, see, I'm sad. I'm glad I warned everyone now. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, excuse the graphicness, he, so, alright, so, while she was begging for her life, he pretty much threw her on the ground and was like, okay, like, I'll set you free. He then took a hatchet and proceeded to chop off Mary's left hand. 
which or like what? it was from the forearm. Oh my god! So Half pretty of her much, arm? yeah, basically. Holy With shit! The hatchet. With the hatchet. Oh. So he cut off her left arm, and like she didn't even like realize what was happening until she like looked at him, and she like saw her arm was still like death gripping to like his arm. Holy shit! Like Holy so, she just saw it hanging oh there. Oh my god! And then he proceeded to cut off her right, but it took more than one just swing. It took, I think they said three swings. Oh my god. Oh my god. Yeah. And while this was all happening, she was like fully conscious and felt everything. Fuck. Oh, she didn't pass out or anything? And I was like, maybe she went into shock. (laughs) No, like she felt everything. Oh my god, that's brutal. He then threw her off a 30 foot cliff in Del Puerto Canyon in uh, Stain Stanislaus County and left her for dead. Holy shit. You know what he did though? The huh. shit pissed me off. He no, shouted, you are free now before leaving. <gasps> Fucking idiot. I'm so glad she survived. I don't know how she's gonna survive. Brittany, you're gonna be like, oh, I misunderstood the topic of this week. She died. <laughs> <laughs> no, she Such survived. So he ended up speeding off, thinking that he would get away with it, but boy, was he wrong. Fucking idiot. (laughs) Mary, who was covered in blood, naked, and determined, fought for her life. She rolled her elbows in the dirt to try to stop the bleeding. Um, Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's that's so much. Goosebumps. Dude. I can't. She somehow managed to drag her body out of the ravine. 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 (laughs) You got this. <laughs> Ravine and back up the cliff. It was yeah. dark by the time she made it up and she was in so much pain but she could hear the traffic so she moved towards the sound. Aww. When she reached the top of the cliff she kept her arms raised so that quote the muscles and blood would not fall out. Like Oof. that was her reasoning. She walked down the road for hours and a red convertible ended up driving by, but they couldn't believe what they were seeing, so they drove off. I mean, like, obviously I don't blame she needed them. help, but I would be freaked out if I saw that, yeah. too. <laughs> I mean, imagine. You'd be like, yo, is that real? Like, yeah. Is that, like, a do my eyes to see girl me? with her yeah. arms missing, covered in dirt. That's, yeah. that's scary, blood. too, because for her, she was probably thinking, like, you know, how many like, more cars hope. will pass by before I bleed out and die? And Basically. I'd be like, is this one of those vanishing hitchhikers? <laughs> <laughs> for real. Yeah, it's scary. So she walked about another three miles before she saw another car. This time, yeah. the couple stopped to help. They oh, covered her elbows with towels and got help. You know, I help toys. I'm always scared listening to these stories of people like hitchhiking to save their life that they're gonna run into another person who's bad. Do you guys ever think that? No. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there's stories like that. Oh yeah, Brandy, I really thought you were gonna be like, so next. No. It scared me. Your face. No. I was like, no. She's no. had so much. No. That I'm always so afraid of that. Whenever we hear stories and they're like, they were trying to get picked That's up. That's true. I well, that was like that, that one serial happened. killer that he kept going back to the same. Oh, girl. Kitty. Yeah, Katie. Katie. Was he? The bystander effect girl? No. No. The serial killer that Brandy talks about, right? Yeah. Oh. I just always got my mind on the bystander. The youngest effect. serial killer in the yeah. US, right? In, the, in Pennsylvania. Back. Oh, yes, yes. His name's not worthy of us remembering. <laughs> uh, it was Harvey Robinson, I think. Harvey Miguel Robinson. Oh, ho, ho, you do remember. I remember he had three names, and I was yes. like, oh, fancy, very serial killer. I was trying to see if I could see it in my, uh, Handy Danny my notes, but I don't <laughs> see it. So Mary spent a month in the hospital, but was determined for police to find Lawrence. So she gave him a detailed description for a sketch, and Lawrence's neighbor saw it and actually called the police. Hell yeah. Yeah. I would love to be there when he saw on the news. They're like, miraculous story. We found this girl, blah, blah, blah. And he'd be like, oh, shit. shit. <laughs> you know if he had, like, a family or anything? If he was living a pretty normal life besides that? Well, while, like, they were in the car, I think he did, like, talk about he had a daughter, or I forgot if it was a daughter or a granddaughter, but that was her age. <gasps> Ew! Yeah. Extra creepy then that he tried to kill her. Mm. So police went to Lawrence's house and searched it and found Mary's cigarettes and remnants of her burnt clothing. He kept it? Mm-hmm. Well, Ew. he tried to burn it, but he failed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So the police couldn't get any evidence from the van because Lawrence and his neighbor ended up deep cleaning it long before the police figured out it was Lawrence. Wait, did his neighbor know? He didn't. Not until after. Okay, I was like, was there like blood? And the neighbor's like, oh, it's clean. Basically. <laughs> or it might have been a different neighbor. They didn't specify. Oh, yeah. Um, he was arrested, but he claimed he picked up Mary and later two other male hitchhikers, Larry and Pedro. He said that they stopped at a bar, smoked dope, and paid to have sex with Mary. He yeah. also claimed he passed out after that and that Larry drove the van to San Francisco. And when he woke up, he saw Mary's clothes in the van, but she was gone. What? He didn't <laughs> Basically, he denies attacking and raping her. Oof. During Lawrence's trial... After Mary gave her testimony and walked by him, he had the audacity to say, I'll finish this job if it takes me the rest of my life. Well, shit, you're looking a little guilty there, pal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wait, finish this job as in killer her? Yeah. For good? Whoa, he would say that in front of... Yeah, in the courtroom. Did everyone hear him? Yeah. Oh. He's like, I, I didn't kill him. you, but if I did, I would finish the job. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't attack you. <laughs> Basically. So, Lawrence was found guilty and convicted of kidnapping, mayhem, attempted murder, forcible rape, sodomy, and forced oral copulation. He received the maximum sentence, but unfortunately at the time, judges could not impose consecutive sentences for each felony. As a result, the max was 14 years and 4 months. Ooh, that is not a long time. Yeah, it's sad. Holy shit. Uh, Mary's nightmare did it in there. No, what? I was hoping for murdered in prison. He <laughs> got out fourteen years later then, or someone else heard her. Um, no, he got out early. No, due Why? to good behavior. Doesn't Why? fucking matter Why? if you have good Ooh. behavior. Who is he gonna rape her and torture there? Ugh. There was no teenage girls in prison. He only served about half a sentence, which was seven years and nine months. Oh my god! Like literally. So he was still like under sixty. Mm hmm. Ew. Right? Well, on February 19th, 1997, a house painter looked inside of a home and saw a naked man stabbing a naked woman. What? It's a little side story. <laughs> what the <laughs> frick? just jump into this? <laughs> the fuck? Police arrived and discovered that the naked man was Lawrence Singleton. And that the woman was 31-year-old Roxanne Hay- Hayes, mother of three and a prostitute. Aww. Um, So, you know, he obviously wasn't rehabilitated and continued his... What do you mean? ...bad ways. <laughs> so Mary decided to testify at Lawrence's trial for Roxanne's murder because she wanted to, ju- to get justice for both of them. Good. Because she did feel, like, super, like... Sad that he didn't get to, like, the maximum sentence, like, death Probably sentence. Probably, like, survivor guilt, too. Oh, definitely. That's and she, really the whole, like, this whole time, she was, like, relearning how to do things and Aww. just upset, like, that he got out early. Oh, and she only, just like, seven years later, right? She was only in her early 20s? Mm-hmm. Holy shit. That's very young to be dealing with. Well, I mean, the other part she's also very young to be dealing with, yeah, but... but this, didn't this event happen almost 20 years later? No, so, Seven. Yeah, but you said 1997. No, yeah, 1997. So well, she was older by then. Yeah, she was I older. I forgot what year this story started. Okay. So she's in her 30s. <laughs> Most likely. Yeah. I mean, I should have done the math. 30s is still pretty young, though, to be doing that. So the, she didn't need to testify, but she wanted to. Like, she was pretty much a character witness. She was like, this guy's a scumbag. <laughs> basically. She basically, like, told the jury again, like, what he did to her. Aww. And he was found guilty and sentenced to death. Good. Fucking finally, dude. I'm actually against the death penalty, but I can't help but say good when people like this are sentenced to it. True. So on December 28th, 2001, Lawrence died of cancer while evading... Uh, awaiting. <laughs> awaiting. Oh! <laughs> My bad. Can't pronounce shit. <laughs> so he died of cancer while awaiting execution. Shit. Of course. Does that not always happen where they die of cancer before they get the death penalty? It feels like it. It, it feels like it happens very That's often. A lot of I think it's just cancer. karma. <laughs> yeah. Fair. Um, but yeah, she she has two kids now. She's married. She's happily married. And she's like obsessed with the reading. 
because it helps her get away from like reality and cope with the pain of like feeling like an outcast. You know? Yeah, she probably doesn't have PTSD arms. too. Yeah, she does. Um, and I guess she actually like is an artist now. Like she like oh, paints and draws. That's cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. That's also sad too to think about how she was a dancer and she lost her arms, which is obviously a key mm-hmm. component to dancing. Yeah, you know, you use your she o- she obviously had, like had to like find herself again. You know. Yeah. yeah. Well, damn. Did she write a book or anything like that, you think? A lot of... No, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> cut it out. It's fine. Brandy, did wanna... she write a book? <laughs> no, I just wanted... No, I don't know. Because um, a lot of survivors with stories like that, they'll write a book about it. No, Why I know she's... she's <laughs> mine, she is <laughs> like an advocate for survivors. That's good. Yeah. Mine, she mine does advocates. art, which is pro- like another form, I don't know, of expression. True. Yeah, she does art for like really... What's it called? That's like, I forgot. I think I. No, I didn't write it down. I wonder if there fucking tools out there. So I was like, the fuck is that noise? So I'm gonna be talking about Jennifer Absen Absenson. Why didn't? Uh, Benson. As Benson. As Benson. Yeah, yes. that sounds right. Um, so Jennifer had a tough childhood. She was raised in a remote desert area where her father built them like a dome house thing. And they had no electricity, they had no running water, and the family struggled financially. So she was mentally and physically abused by her mom, and she was given the responsibility of taking care of her handicapped brother. She believes the way she grew up was a contributing factor to her getting kidnapped, but also of her surviving. Um, A quote I read in an article said, Because of the way I was treated at home, I take risks and trust people. I had no self-esteem, self-respect, or self-love. I was naive. So, big, big disclaimer again for the following. I'm getting most of this information from a video that Jennifer actually posted herself on YouTube. I'm going to put the link in the bio, but she goes into extreme detail about what happened, so please be wary because it's super disturbing at times. She also took the video in the exact location that her attack took place, going there for the first time since it happened. I believe it was like 24 years later. So, on the night of September 27th, 1992, 19-year-old Jennifer was on her way to her job in Desert Hot Springs, California, where she worked with children with disabilities. She was working the night shift and was distressed because she missed her bus. She wasn't used to the new bus schedule and had gone into a store to buy some candy for the kids she worked with and had been told before that she was late one more time she'd be fired. Suddenly, an ex-Marine named Andrew Yerdiolis pulled over in his light-colored sedan and offered her a ride. She was a little hesitant, but ended up agreeing. She thought he was nice and seemed like a normal guy, and he gained her trust. It's always hitchhiking. That's why whenever you were mentioning hitchhiking earlier, I was like, mine is hitchhiking too. Not even just the 70s, this was in the 90s. Mm-hmm. I read um, also one thing. I don't know if this is correct, because she didn't say in her video, but I saw in an interview that she also got in the car because she thought that he looked like the kind of guy she could beat up if she needed to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Which... It's so funny. Before I started dating Robert, I was I was very into more like skinny guys, and I was like, yeah, I need to know I could fuck him up if they try anything. Oh my God, that's so <laughs> and funny. now Robert literally used to power lift and do like six hundred pounds weights, but I used to do a thousand, so we're good. Uh, yeah. Totally. <laughs> he did say some weird things to Jennifer though, like when she mentioned wanting to be an actor, he asked if she'd be interested in porn. But she just said no and called him a sicko. And he seemed annoyed at first or, like, angry, but he just laughed it off eventually. She told him all about her work because she was proud of it, how she worked alone with several girls who had disabilities and were kind of helpless. She told him about the about what time she was off work and how she'd be taking the bus home alone the next morning. Andrew asked Jennifer for her number, but she wasn't interested, so she gave him a fake number before going into work. So, yeah, like I said, she was trusting him. She even said in the beginning how she was, like, naive and stuff. So she was like, yeah, I work alone all night, and I do this, and I'm going home alone mm. in the morning. So she felt a little weird when she got inside, so she called a friend to see if they could pick her up in the morning. But they weren't available because their car was broken down. She figured she was just overreacting anyway and went to work. The next morning, her coworker showed up at 6 a.m. to relieve her of her shift, and she went outside and started to prepare her backpack to go walk to the bus stop. She looked down in the direction of it and saw a car that she thought looked like Andrew's with someone in it, but she thought she was being paranoid and her mind was playing tricks on her. She wasn't necessarily scared, but her... <laughs> That's Chunk. <laughs> That's the dog. I might keep that in just for reference of the weird-ass <laughs> noises this fucking dog makes. He's like... <laughs> he just rolls around. It's cute. It's... It's interesting. <laughs> anyway. It's cute. It's cute. <laughs> Brandy's decided... <laughs> So, Jennifer wasn't necessarily scared, but her gut feeling to 
her gut feeling told her to walk the other way, so she did, even though that area was more desolate. And listening to the story, I was like, oh no, tell me she didn't walk towards the car. And she didn't, and it still ended badly. So, as she was walking, she heard the sound of wheels pulling up next to her. She wasn't even afraid. Remember, she grew up with no electricity, so no TV to hear about, like, kidnappers or serial killers. Instead, she was just thinking, like, okay, how am I going to get this guy to leave me alone? I'm not interested in him. She just thought she was going to reject him again. Mm -hmm. So, he spoke to her out of his window and asked if she wanted breakfast, but she just laughed and was like, no thanks, I'm not interested. He then asked if she wanted to ride home, and she was like, sure, whatever. Um, I imagine she probably wasn't worried, because if he was going to hurt her, why wouldn't he just do it the night before? And Which also, reminds me yeah. of your story, Brandy, um, in our male serial, or no, our online killer one, right? Was that the one? Where the girl went on date with that oh, other yeah, girl? it was the second date. It was the second date that she got attacked, because you assume people are going to do it the first time you meet them. Yeah. Especially, like, in the morning compared to night, but it was six in the morning, so it wasn't exactly bright. After driving for a little, Andrew casually brought up the fake phone number, Jennifer. She lied and said it was her work's phone number, and he began to get angry and started to scream at her, saying that she was lying, because he had called the number and it was some random ass person that answered. He grabbed her by the hair and slammed her head to the dashboard. Then he pulled out a gun, and Jennifer said she went into shock. He then pulled out twine and tied Jennifer's hands behind her back. She couldn't believe this was happening, and she just kept asking him, is this a joke? He began to drive them again, and she was trying to plead with him. At one point, he stopped driving. Sorry, guys. It's, it's This is still starting to get graphic. So at one point, he stopped driving, unzipped his pants, and tried to get her to go down on him. She said she couldn't because at the time, he wasn't able to get hard. He had erectile dysfunction. And when she said that, he hit her in the head. She sat up and tried to look out to see where they were, and he put sunglasses and a hat on her before reclining her seat back all the way so she couldn't see anything. Jennifer was super familiar with the area, and she said that she was just thinking, please don't turn where I think you're going to turn, because that means we're going out into the middle of nowhere. He turned. She could only see out the top of the window since she was leaning back, and said she just saw telephone poles, and as each one passed, she lost more and more hope. Hmm. The video is, it's very sad, watching her talk about it. Like, her getting emotional stuff, it sucks. When Jennifer said they passed about 20 of these telephone poles, he pulled over and into an empty desert area. And at this point, she knew she was going to die. But what scared her the most was that she didn't know what he was going to do to her before he killed her. He climbed on top of her seat and punched her before he began to rip and cut off her jean shorts and underwear with a knife. He then tried to cut off her sweatshirt, but stopped because it would take too long. She thought she was about to be raped, but said she didn't even care because that's not the worst thing he could have done to her. He cut off her bra under her sweatshirt. She said he was moving so fast and methodically, methodically like this was the perfect scenario for him. The only thing she could think was that she was in hell. He was straddling her on the seat and tried to rape her, but was unable to perform again because he had like erectile dysfunction. She'd never had sex before and knew something was wrong and this scared her. She was telling him that this was fine, that he could rape her, just let her live. He didn't respond and just stared at her and she said she felt like she was looking into the eyes of the devil. Mm. And she also said in the video, it was kind of sad, like, watching this part, she uh, mentioned the erectile dysfunction thing. She said how she likes mentioning that he had erectile dysfunction because she knows that it makes him mad and that makes her happy. She's like, you know, that shouldn't make me happy. And I was like, oh my gosh. It's like her way of getting back at him. Yeah, basically. So he told her to tell him that she loved him and she said it, even though she'd never said this to anyone before, like, not even her parents. So it didn't sound convincing. He grabbed her... He grabbed her underwear and shoved it down her mouth and into her throat until she was choking and felt like she was drowning. Jesus Christ. Then he tied her bra around her head to hold the underwear in place. She was able to dislodge the underwear thanks to her gag reflex making move upwards and she was able to say I love you again. He then took off the bra and underwear um, and took it off of her face. He said to tell her she loved him again and she did while trying her best to sound convincing. He then began to get mad and strangle her. She couldn't move her legs because he was sitting on her and her arms were still tied behind, so all she could do was stare into his eyes and wish that she was able to kill herself right then with her thoughts. And she wondered why God didn't give people that power. What? I, it's like... God didn't God didn't give people that power because he knew teenagers. Oh, yeah. I thought that you were making a joke for a second. I oh. was like, oh. <laughs> You're saying that that power really exists? Just think about yeah. every teenager ever. True. And their depressive face. Basically. Well, and adults depressed. <laughs> I know. Um, so he kept strangling her and she said she didn't feel any pain, but she couldn't breathe in or out and felt like she was gagging over and over. 
All she could think was that life was so short and she wanted to somehow spread all of the love that she had in her heart for her friends and family to go to them and let them know that she loved them and that she was okay. Then she said she saw a white light, or like she just saw white and couldn't remember what happened, but she felt happy. She thinks that she may have died for a second, but it, she could have potentially just passed out. She doesn't know how much time passed, but when she came to, she saw Andrew's eyes going from close up and far away over and over. Suddenly, her body kind of woke up along with her, like, open up her eyes, and it made her realize that he was pounding on her chest and banging her head, and she had no idea if he was trying to resuscitate her or just hurting her more. Yeah, because when you say banging on her head but also banging on her chest, the chest can be resuscitated. I imagine it's, like, her chest, and he's doing it so hard she just keeps moving her head, like, reflex, by reflex. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but I don't know for sure. And she wasn't sure trying to resuscitate or hurt her. Or even if he was trying to resuscitate her, it would just be to torture her more. Yeah. I figured. Um, Jennifer said she felt him sucking on her neck as she just laid there and wished that she could die and was thinking, hurry up and kill me. When he came up and opened his mouth a little, she could see blood and skin in his mouth and realized he hadn't been sucking but was trying to bite out a chunk of her neck. Shut the the fuck fuck up. up. It's so... I... It's fucked up. And what she thought must have been saliva going down her chest was actually blood. Andrew pulled her out of the car and she figured she must be about to die. He went to the truck and pulled out a bag with knives in it and began to move it to the back seat of his car. When she saw the knives, she began to run, but he was able to catch her and drag her by her hair through cactus and rocks back to the car. He told her to go down on him and she told him no, called him a coward and told him to kill her. She thinks he likes when she pled for her life and she'd want to let him torture her anymore and just hope that he'd kill her sooner rather than later because she figured that that was going to happen in the end anyway and just mm-hmm. wanted to be done with the torture. He began to toy with her again by grabbing a gun and shoving it in her mouth. She said she was just imagining the back of her head coming off but thought it was okay because at least it'd be quick. Holy shit. But he didn't pull the trigger. Instead, he took it out of her mouth and shoved her in his truck. Trunk. Sorry. She didn't know what to do, but she didn't have much time to think. And I'm not religious at all. I'm just gonna be saying what she says. In the video, she, like, even says, like, she's not preaching. She's just telling her story of what she thinks happened. But she remembers well in the trunk that her grandma told her if anything bad was happening, to pray. She was hyperventilating while praying and yelling and begging God to help her just break free. She even begged that if she wasn't gonna get free, to please just kill her right now. She suddenly heard that the twine was tearing off and was able to free her arms. For a second, she wanted to use the twine to strangle herself to death, but her body, like, of course, you can't... You're going to react in a way you can't strangle yourself to death that way. She said something came over her, and it was like the whole trunk was lit up, which could have to do with, like, she grew up with no electricity, so she'd kind of, like, trained herself to be able to get used to seeing things in the dark. She began to think, like, okay, the key to the trunk is probably in the middle, so there's got to be something I can move to unlock it. Remember, this was in 92, so there was no trunk release that they have now. Right. Jennifer began to rip the trunk apart and was able to grab a latch and open the trunk. She didn't want to open it all the way because Andrew was going fast, so she let it open up enough for him to see it, then she pulled it down without closing it, so he pulled over, and it worked. So he came and shut the trunk again, and I'm not sure if I misunderstood anything, but I think this was okay because she now knew where the latch was. He was obviously in a rush to drive off because he was afraid, like, people would see Jennifer. She thinks by this time it was almost 8 o'clock in the morning. So she listened to him as he pulled out too fast and got stuck in soft sand. She could hear him, like, kind of going in a cycle, like, he would try and drive. Then she could hear him turning his head to yell at her from up front. So she was able to time it correctly and quickly pulled the latch again, got out of the trunk, and began to run down this road with hardly any traffic, like, when he was doing the sand. Hmm. So... The first car Jennifer tried to get to, she was running alongside, grabbing onto the side view mirror, but she couldn't hear the woman. In, she could hear the woman inside telling, presumably, her husband to go and drive away faster, Aww. and they drove off without helping her. She looked back and saw why the woman was trying to get away. Andrew was chasing her down the road, wielding a machete. <gasps> so how fucking scary is Wait, that? Well, I would like make her jump in though, and then yeah. drive off. I'd be like, I don't care. I'm getting in your fucking car. <laughs> That's, That's so fuck, fucked up. Like, she could tell that. Jennifer was running from the guy with the machete, and she just told her husband to keep driving. Girl, he probably wanted to stop. I would have pulled my window down and fucking held I'd her. I'd be like, jump in! <laughs> yeah, basically, I would have fucking held her while you, like, we drove yeah. off. This kind of reminds me of what we were saying earlier. Like, if you see people on the side of the road, like, freaking out, like, you could also get I freaked mean, out, too. Yeah, you could think, like, scary. this is part of a scam or something, and she's no, with and him. It, it, it's very possible. Yeah. That's the scary part. Yeah. It's very scary. So she ran towards another oncoming oncoming truck, and thankfully the two Marines inside picked her up, gave her a pair of jeans, and Jennifer told them what happened. All the while, Andrew was like, uh-huh, 
gonna make a run for it. <laughs> so they started to try to drive off. Yes. So they took her to the police station where she recounted her story, and nobody believed her. Ah. Uh, even her own parents didn't believe her because she was a good storyteller and had a good imagination because she grew up without TV and stuff. So they um, even told the police, like, oh, no, she's just a really good storyteller. Like, they, this didn't happen. Weren't they abusive, too? Uh, I read on a couple sources that her mom was abusive. Okay. So the police interrogated her, asking if a boyfriend had attacked her. They tried to take her to different places in the desert, not listening to her directions, asking if she was sure it didn't happen there. And she just kept telling them, like, no, I fucking know where it happened. You guys aren't going where I'm telling you to go. So they were unable to get any physical evidence. Even the place where his car had gotten stuck earlier, unfortunately, ended up having construction done on it, so they couldn't find tire marks. All they had to go off of was twine marks on her arm and the bite mark on her neck. So they measured the bite mark and again asked if she'd gone to a fight with a boyfriend. She was adamant that no, this was not a boyfriend, this was a killer, and he'd definitely done this before, but of course they didn't listen to her. Whoa, this is fucking crazy. It's so crazy. How can you see someone with literally, like, a bite mark on their neck and, like, all their clothes torn off and you're just like, are we sure it wasn't a boyfriend, even though you don't have one? (laughs) Even if there was a fucking boyfriend, arrest him. Yeah, do something. So she realized the only way she could, like, talk to people about it is whenever they see her bandaged arms and asked what happened. But as her wounds healed, people stopped asking. So then she began to self-harm by cutting her arms as a way to release her pain and kind of in a way talk about it. Like a few of sites I read about, they said like she did that so people would see the bandages again and she could be like, oh, this happened to me. This continued until a friend caught her self-harming and Jennifer was sent into a mental hospital. She was in and out of the hospital, I believe for years and believes that, and thinks that she temporarily went insane. She was on several medications, diagnosed with lots of different mental illnesses, and even once told a psychologist that she made it all up because she'd been told by so many people, including doctors, that she was a liar, and she almost began to believe it herself. Ooh, they were all gaslighting her. They were. So, five years after Jennifer was attacked, Andrew uh, Urdiolis, he was arrested and confessed to the attack and to being a serial killer who had killed eight other women over the course of ten years in Illinois and California. Jennifer was the only one who got away. Whoa. And I believe she was, like, she would have been, like, victim three, four, five or something like that. She was not wow. the first, and she was not the last. So if she, maybe they would have taken her seriously. That they would have prevented. Pre- they could have prevented, like, several of their deaths. Yes. I uh, read on one source that, like, whenever she found out that he, like, attacked other people, she, like, asked the investigators, like, can I talk to the other women? Like, I want to talk to them about our experiences. And she found that she was the only one who survived him. Oh, my God. So, Andrew was sentenced to death in Illinois, but this was changed to life without the possibility of parole when Illinois banned the death penalty. He was later extradited to California to be tried for his murders, and he was sentenced to death again. But just months later, instead took his own life in his cell at the age of 54 in late 2018. Bitch. Little bitch. Yeah. But yeah, I would highly recommend watching this video of her. I'll include the link. Jennifer has since written a book about not only her surviving a serial killer, but the rest of her life and its challenges as well. It's called The Girl in the Treehouse. She seems super brave and is an advocate for victims who can't speak for themselves and speaks openly about mental illness. She learned to love and accept herself and regain control of her life. Jesus Christ. And her book, I thought it was interesting, is called The Girl in the Treehouse because I was kind of confused by it, but she's talking about she started writing it after, like, um, breaking up with maybe, like, a boyfriend or husband or something, and they had a treehouse, and she just, like, lives in the treehouse now and has just turned into, like, a cool-ass home. (laughs) It's kind of sick. Wow. That's it? Yeah. Damn. These these are some crazy stories. If it shows a crazy topic. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I thought mine was really crazy. I mean, mine is... It is. It is not just one woman. It is three women at the same time. Oh, So, that's pretty crazy. Brandy's was really graphic. Michelle's was sad that nobody believed her, but I'm glad they finally caught him in the end. It only took several other people dying. Yeah, well... But who's counting? But who's counting, right? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to be talking about the amazing, yet obviously heartbreaking story of the Cleveland kidnapping survivors. For over a decade, three young women, Michelle Knight, Amanda Berry, and Gina De Jesus, were imprisoned by a man named Ariel Castro in his Cleveland, Ohio home. I've heard of this. Mm-hmm. It was a huge story. So what seems like a quiet, modest home from the outside hid some really disturbing secrets on the inside. During the many years they were held captive, the girls held a hope that their families would never give up on them. That faith eventually is what helped bring them home. 
Although I don't like to give much attention to the piece of shit, Ariel, I think it is important to know a little bit more about him. So his name, like I said, was Ariel Castro. He was born in Puerto Rico in 1960, but relocated to America when he was little. In 1992, he and his longtime girlfriend, Grimilda, moved into 2207 Seymour Avenue. And this would later become the house that Castro would hold the girls hostage. The couple had four children together, although I can't really confirm if this happened before or after they moved into the home. Um, but regardless, according to close family, once the couples lived under the same roof, all hell bro- broke loose. And that that's for um, his girlfriend, that is. It was not, her living hell. Not the people he abducted. <laughs> well, you'll see, but... Them too. <laughs> they actually they ended up breaking up and she ended up moving out. Oh, but okay. he began to severely beat her, breaking her nose multiple times, Ugh. her ribs, arms, and causing a blood clot on her brain that resulted in an op- inoperable tumor. Holy so, like, he shit. literally beat her so bad that she got a tumor in her brain. Oh my goodness. Um, Castro actually was arrested for domestic violence charges against his girlfriend, but he was never indicted by a jury, so he got away with that. That's dumb. Yeah. Um, Luckily, Grimilda was able to eventually leave him and gain full custody of their four children. This didn't come without some resistance by Castro, as he repeatedly threatened her and would abduct their daughters, but when I say abduct, I mean, I think... He didn't have he didn't have um, visitations with them, so he would just take the daughters without asking her. So I think oh. they'd actually they'd want to go visit him and stuff. But you know when they're when Maybe you're un- it was yeah when you're when you're under eighteen it's considered abduction. So that's what I mean. I don't mean to say like he like forced them or anything. Yeah. I think they went along um, willingly. I don't know. So he was served many restraining orders by Grimilda, but most were eventually dropped. In 2012, complications from brain injuries that Grimilda had suffered from his beatings would ultimately be what killed her. How old was she? Um, I'm not sure. I never, I didn't get her age, but, because oh, okay. that's not the main story I'm going to get to. I just wanted to give a little bit of his background on that's what sad. he had done before. Yeah, mm-hmm. really sad. Did he get custody of his kids when she died? 2012? Um, he, they might he was, too old. 2012, I think he ended up getting arrested in 2012 or 2013. Oh, so, so if he did, only for a second. Yes. <laughs> I don't think he ever got custody because at the time, if he was holding the women, he would just say, like, oh, I don't want custody. And I want to say also, too, that they were, by, no, by 2012, they were all over 18. I know that all for sure. Okay. I know that for sure, and you'll find out why I know that very, okay. <laughs> very soon. It'll make sense. So Castro worked as a bus driver for, for Cleveland Metropol... Ooh, Metropol... Metropolitan? Yes, Metropolitan. I literally wrote out how to pronounce it because I struggle with that word. So he worked for the school district for most of his adult life, but was fired due to poor judgment. This included making an illegal U-turn with children on his bus, (laughs) using his bus to go grocery shopping. That's fucking funny. I'm sorry. I would laugh if I saw that. (laughs) Leaving a child on the bus while he went for lunch. Oh my god, this is me. I know. And leaving the bus unattended while he took a nap at home. What? Oh, I, yeah. Oh my God. So not not what just one like? fuck up, several fuck ups. So after losing his job and his children, Castro maintained a relatively average looking life from the outside. He played bass in a band and kept in close contact with his family. But under all that, he was hiding a dark secret. And by dark secret, I mean three, three women in his house. Yes, three dark secrets. <laughs> so enough about him. Um, let's get into the actual stories. So his first victim was Michelle Knight. Michelle had a very rough childhood, living in poverty and suffering physical and sexual abuse by her own family. Eventually, she became fed up and ran away from home. In school, she was constantly bullied throughout, like, junior high and high school for only being four foot seven and was taunted as the name Shorty. Oh, she was tiny. Super small. So in her later teens, she met a boy and ended up becoming pregnant. And then soon after, she had her son, Joey, who would become her entire world. Yeah. Um, she wanted to become the best mother she could possibly be for him, and then she kind of vowed to change her life over. Uh, one day, Michelle asked her mom and her mom's boyfriend if they could babysit Joey while she went job hunting. What she didn't know was that her mom's boyfriend was drunk and would take out an aggression on her child. Oh, fuck. He grabbed Joey by the leg and fractured his knee, so it's, oh. not, it's not as bad as I but that's still made it out to see. pretty bad. Yeah. Um, so when Michelle got home, she was obviously super freaked out and angry, and she immediately took Joey to the hospital, where she was met by Child Protective Services, who ended up taking her son to live in foster care. It wasn't even her. Yep. Oh, shit. Mm Mm-hmm. But she was also a teen mom, too, so I was gonna say, it probably contributed to her being a teen mom. Yep, Mm -hmm. it did. That's fucked up. 
Frustrated but determined, Michelle began the necessary steps to get Joey back. At the time of her disappearance, she had already scheduled the court hearing um, to get his custody. On August 23, 2002, she had a preliminary appointment re regarding her custody battle, but was having a really hard time finding the correct address. She walked into a dollar store to ask the clerk if he knew where the address was, but he was no help. He, he didn't really know. Unexpectedly, in walks Ariel Castro, who in an interview she refers to as my best friend's dad. What? Yep, that's right. Her soon-to-be abductor was her childhood best friend's father. What? So he knew her, like, her entire life, probably. Yeah. So oh she was God. trusting of him. He offered her a ride to the appointment because he knew where the address was and mentioned to Michelle that his daughter was actually at his house visiting if she wanted to stop by the house later that day. Holy shit. And um, she was really excited to see her old friend because obviously she said this was her old best friend, so... She agrees, not suspecting anything. Yeah, if I, it was like my childhood friend and I was a teenager, exactly. I would have accepted a ride from them too. Yeah, exactly, because I'm sure there was shit. times before she, where she even went over to the house, yeah. you know? Also, this is kind of, not the same, but almost hitchhiker vibes too. Everyone's accepting rides from people. Yeah, yeah. you That's wouldn't expect weird. it. Yep. So, once she enters the house, Castro directs her to a room and closes the door and begins to undress himself. <gasps> and I'm not going to go into detail, but you can assume what happened next. Um, the abuse would continue for the next 11 years for Michelle. Oh so she was God. there the longest. 11 years. Oh, my God. Like, can you fucking imagine? She would live in chains and shackles secured in the middle of the room. She couldn't tell if it was night or day because he kept the windows boarded and a motorcycle helmet on her head. Jeez. And from, from what I heard, it seems like that was only for the first few months. Um, I think that was removed later on. He probably, like... That was able to of her? No, not really. Oh. <laughs> um, she would live in the chains and shackles still, um, but he took off, like, the helmet, and I think he just let the windows boarded at that point. But in the beginning, I know for sure she had a motorcycle helmet. Fuck. Yeah. So Michelle's disappearance received a really laughable investigation. So from the start, you know, I mentioned her family was, she had mentioned they were abusive. Mm -hmm. uh, her family and authorities thought that she had just voluntarily ran away after losing custody of her son. They just, uh, they just thought she threw in the towel and gave up. It was really bad timing. Yep. And then just 15 months after she uh, was pronounced, like, dis or, Missing? She, yeah, missing. She, her name was taken off the list of missing persons. Why? What? Her family took her off. What the fuck? Yeah. Did your family just choose to do that when you're still missing? Um, <laughs> I think we, I think you can pronounce someone dead, but I they didn't pronounce her dead. They just took her off the list, or maybe authorities, and, you know, like police officers and her family did it together. That's anyway, like weird. from the beginning, she was kind of set up for failure. She was set up for failure. Yeah, she like there was no media attention on her because, you know, less than sixteen months later, she was gone. Like nobody really knew her. Nobody really cared. Her family didn't want to keep talking about her. Just they gone. Thought so. She was like a teen mom runaway. Yeah, who didn't even have her fucking kid, like... And she would, The sad thing is, she was so excited to get her son back. She remembers thinking... Uh. That was, like, the main thing that kept her alive, too, is she's like, oh, I really hope someday I'm gonna see Joey. Oh, that's really sad. I know. During her imprisonment, Michelle would become pregnant five times, but each time, Castro would beat her until the pregnancy was aborted. Holy so she shit. kind of got it the worst of all the girls. Um, you'll, I'll mention later how the other two were treated, but... All the girls agreed later on after they got out that Michelle got it. The, Michelle got it the worst. Like she was Castro's most hated. I like this. I don't know if this sounds fucked up. But I was gonna say you could just find like medications that you can mix together to like make somebody have an abortion. He, he was just abusive chose though. To beat her. Instead. Yeah. He liked to do that. I mean, I guess if you're gonna kid some kidnap somebody, you're not gonna have a problem beating them. Until yeah. Scary. So <laughs> I also. Um, I listened to probably like an hour worth of interviews from all the girls because they were very open about talking about it once they were released. But they were saying that in the beginning they used to cry a lot and, you know, beg him to stop. And then they realized that he kind of was getting off on that. So they learned to just be quiet and just not really react or anything because he didn't like that as much. That's kind of like mine where the girl was just saying, yeah. like, no, I mean, just kill me. Fuck yeah, you. it's kind of like reverse psychology. Like, if you do get tied up and say, like, okay, fucking kill me, and then they don't like that. They're, they're like, yeah. ugh. <laughs> what do you mean? Like, you're supposed to be scared. You're, yeah. supposed, to, you're supposed to get me excited. Yeah, like, exactly. You're like, just kill me faster. Yeah. <laughs> you're basically just like, no. Nah. Not playing nah. your mind games. Yeah. Basically. All right, so eight months later, Castro would strike again. On April 23rd, 2003, he was out prowling for his next victim. 
Amanda Berry had just begun her walk home from her shift at Burger King when Castro pulled up alongside her. He offered her a ride home, and she gladly accepted. Hmm. Was but, she, she a teenager? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think she she was 16, Oof. about to be 17 the next day. Oh, um, look. She gladly accepted because she knew Castro. No. She no, had no. been very good friends with one of his other daughters, just as Michelle had been. What the fuck? So I, I believe Castro had three daughters and one son, to put oh that in perspective. God. Oh, he also didn't even have custody of his kids, huh? So. Nope. Oh, he did sorry. not. That probably made it shaky. Sorry if it got shaky. My leg was getting sweaty from my laptop. <laughs> the saddest thing about this, is about her abduction, is Amanda was considering calling out for her shift that day because it was her 17th birthday the following day, and she actually had plans with her family to celebrate that night, but decided against calling out. And I can't imagine, like, living with that regret. Like, she mentioned it in an interview. She's like, I wonder what would have happened if I would have called out like I was planning on doing. That's so so if you guys are ever wanting to call out of work, just fucking call out of work. That's all I gotta say. What if the reverse <laughs> happens and you call out and you go to a store and you get kidnapped? Whoa. You just never know when something's gonna happen. Yeah. Just just try to... I, I'm like, I don't even know what to say. Just try not to get kidnapped. Trust no one <laughs> and be observant. So for the first few months, Amanda had no idea that there was another girl in the house, Michelle. Wait, how? Um, they were in different, different rooms. Yeah. Whoa. And um, Castro actually kept telling Amanda during the first few months he would eventually let her go once he found another girl. But obviously that wasn't true because yeah. she was the second girl. He already had another Holy girl. Holy shit. And she had no idea that Michelle had already been there for the past year. And it wasn't until months later that the girls first saw each other and realized they weren't alone in their captivity. So they saw it. I think um, it mentions that uh, Castro walks Amanda past the room and then that's when she first sees Michelle in there. Oh my God. Like, Does she react? Um, oh, they probably sure. don't talk about it. I mean, that's probably somewhere out there, but there's there's hours worth of interviews, and they actually yeah. both had books, which I'll mention the names at the end. Okay. Or the three girls had books, actually. So, a year after Amanda went missing, her mother was in the audience on the Montel Williams show to speak to psychic Sylvia Brown. She stood up in the audience and asked the psychic about Amanda, and the psychic replied, Your daughter is not alive, honey. And obviously, like, so I guess Amanda and her mom would watch the show all the, t- all the time, and they were really into, like, the Monta Williams show, and then he just had, like, a guest psychic on at the time. And I I think I read that Castro would let the girls watch TV, and she actually was able to see her mother's reaction. And so her mom literally started breaking down crying on national TV because she believed it. She believed that her daughter was actually also, dead. what kind of fucking douchebag would just say that as, your daughter is not alive, honey? Yeah. Instead of being like... I don't think so. I know. Like, layered on softly, at least. Fucking um, dick. Another crazy thing, too, about Sylvia Brown, the psychic, is there was another time where somebody asked, like, where's my son at? Because their their son had been missing. And then she said, oh, he's he's alive. He's out there, honey. I'm just mad. She said, honey. honey. <laughs> um, and the son was actually found dead. So, God. I think bitch. Who's still inviting yeah, her on shows? Yeah. So she got a ton of backlash for that, as she should. Good. Poor thing. Um... So, right after she came home from, like, that, being in the audience on that show, she ended up getting rid of all of Amanda's items. Um, she got rid of, like, her laptop, everything. And I think she just kind of gave up hope and just wanted to forget. You know, she kind of became numb to it all. And then in 2006, um, she ended up dying of heart failure, but (gasps) those closest to her believe she died of a broken heart. So, imagine if... She never knew... She never knew her. She never got to see her daughter oh, again. Oh, my God. And um, Amanda Brown, um, Amanda Berry's uh, mom was very, very active, like, always throwing, uh, what, what like would Like, memorial call services? Not uh, memorials, but um, it's called memorial. They're, they're deceased. She uh, was on the show. Yeah, vigils. She was throwing Amanda vigils. Um, she was really trying to keep her memory alive, and then so people didn't forget but then as soon as she came back from the TV show, it was like her spirits were just completely gone. She wow. lost all hope. And yeah, I mean, it's sad because you wonder if the psychic would have answered, yes, your daughter's life. She probably would have held out hope because I definitely think that's the thing. Like, she could have just died of a broken heart, honestly. Like, she, if she had other sad. conditions coming up in her, she probably didn't want to get anything treated. Like, yeah. if she had heart conditions, she probably would just keep on doing whatever. So it just got worse and she would end up dying because she was felt hopeless. That's yeah. so fucked up. Mm-hmm. Psychic's a bitch. Fuck I'm sure right. she got sued or something. I hope so. So, flash forward another year to April 2nd, 2004. 14-year-old, 
14, the youngest Aww. of all of them. Gina de Jesus was walking home from school with Castro's daughter, Arlene. Is this a different daughter? Like, they all three were friends with different daughters, you think? Well, I know that at least uh, there was at least two different daughters. I want to say that was three different daughters because they were all, you know, all the girls were at various ages. Like, one was 17, one was 14. And then, um, what did I say? Michelle was... Seven, or she was 17, right? Yeah, I think she was 17. Let me check. Okay, I don't know. Or 16. Something um, like that. But they were all different ages, so I... And he had three daughters, so it could potentially be that he had duck, abducted a friend from each of his daughter's friend groups. Oh, that's what I was kind of thinking. It's kind of fucking weird, because the sisters probably were, like, all together, and, like, it's kind of fucked up how we've all had a friend go missing. Yeah! Yeah, I completely agree. I wonder if they ever had that conversation. But at the same time, too... Um, they thought one would run away too. Yeah, and you would never really think of, you know, your father yeah, doing yeah. that. Yeah, so. they were probably scared it was going to happen to them too if it happened to their friend. Yeah. So Gina de Jesus was walking home from school with Castro's daughter Arlene. Apparently, the two girls were planning a sleepover at Gina's that night, but needed to get their parents' permission at first. Ugh. Um, but so Ar- Arlene's mom, aka Castro's ex-wife Grimilda, told her she couldn't go, so the two girls parted ways. Gina continued to walk home, and Castro ended up pulling up alongside her in her car. Um, he offered her a ride home, and obviously trusting him, like, literally she had just invited his daughter to spend the night. Yeah. Like, she got in his car, and she, they made their way to her house, but not really her house. Um, she would end up, obviously, going back to Castro's home, where she would be for the next nine years. Oh, my goodness. And it's just the craziest thing, too, that... Arlene, Castro's daughter, would be the last person to see Gina before her disappearance. Oh, yeah. Holy shit. So, His kids were probably getting, like, um, interrogated by police and having no idea what happened that maybe. their dad was involved. I don't think anybody assumed it was anyone Kid related to their family. No, no I, I just meant because she's the last person to see her. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. So crazy. And it's crazy, too, because I, I couldn't find if this is true or not, but I want to assume that maybe Arlene, the daughter, had called... Um, Ariel Castro and asked like hey um, can I spend the night because she needed both of her parents permission because they were separated at the time uh, so she called each one and then maybe that's how he was able to find Gina because he knew where they were yeah. where they were walking together in 2004 both Amanda and Gina were featured in a segment of America's Most Wanted where both of their disappearances were linked also side note oh. I thought I thought America's Most Wanted was like for criminals but I guess they've done dis- I think it's both okay I guess they've done like missing people too yeah yeah, so they were linked already, you know, just a year after Gina went missing. But never... Never this, Michelle, because yeah. everyone forgot about her. So the disappearances received tons of media attention all the way up until 2012, because the families continued to hold vigils. They really never stopped um, trying to find the girls. Unfortunately, though, like I said, Michelle's... They threw the towel in within, like, I a few months. Amanda, I thought it was Amanda's that they threw in the towel. Uh-uh. No, Michelle, it's the first girl. Oh, Amanda's the second girl. Amanda's the mom. Her mom died. Amanda's, yeah, Amanda's mom ended up dying, but the rest of her family kept fighting for her. Michelle is the one that was abused. She had oh, the son. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it can be confusing got, with three names. And also, you said that Amanda's mom kind of stopped hosting the vigils. Yeah, That's so, what confused so me. Amanda's mom kind of gave up hope, but, but the rest of her family didn't. No, they never gave up. Okay. Gotcha. She just had a broken heart. So, since Castro knew both of the girls' families, both, um, oh my God. yeah, Michelle and Gina, he actually would sometimes go to the vigils, <gasps> and, yeah, it's it's confirmed that he went to at least one of them over the years. That's fucked. And, apparently, at one point, he even participated in a search party uh, with Gina's family, and even tried to become close with them, like... That's creepy. Yeah. Which... It's a strange thing how common we see this occurring with kidnapping or murder cases that um, this the assailant will try to insert literally themselves. insert <laughs> themselves in the case and try to get close to the family. It's weird. And it makes you wonder like maybe it's something they want to feel they want to feel like they're in control or they want to find out what they know. Yeah, they definitely want to find out what they know. But I think that's so fucking mind blowing how close he was to all these families like it was all his daughter's I friends think, oh yeah it's so scary he like cherry picked through his daughter's friends yeah that's fucking weird and it made it so that nobody would suspect him too because he would always go to the vigils he would go be close to the family like they wouldn't think you know well now i i don't know if back then but now i feel like it's a known thing that or just in tv shows i'm talking yeah. about where they're always like oh keep an eye out for anyone suspicious at the yep. vigils but he wasn't suspicious he was a random person yeah 
He was there with his daughters. Yep, crazy. So on Christmas Day 2006, Amanda gave birth to her and Castro's baby, who she named Jocelyn. So it's obviously important to, to note that she, Castro allowed her to actually go through the pregnancy and have a baby, which that, which is really pointed out to the fact that um, everyone thought that he Michelle hated Michelle the most treated. for some mm-hmm. fucking That's reason. That's so strange. Um, and it made me think of something that I had heard before that usually when people are like kidnapped, um, like if it is a group of people, they usually target the one who's been abused before because they can tell that they're the weakest. And she was the only one that was abused before, so mm-hmm. makes you wonder. That reminded me of my story how the um, how the woman said that she had like a rough childhood and that kind of set her up for babies because I feel like you read a lot of statistics like unfortunately if you've been abused before it's likely that you're gonna become yeah. a victim again because somehow abusers can just like fucking sense I it. I know it's a weird they have a sixth not sense good for it. superpower that mm-hmm. they have. Yeah, it's pretty sad. So um, on Christmas Day he brought a small inflatable swimming pool for the birth. Because obviously he's not going to take her to the hospital because sure. he would get arrested. Um, and he told Michelle, who already had a child before Joey, like I said, that she would be assisting in delivering the baby. Mm-hmm. And he threatened to kill her if anything happened to the baby or the baby didn't survive. <gasps> what so if literally, they like or something? Yeah, exactly. So literally, Michelle is just constantly getting the shit into the stick. Obviously, they Gina, are, but yeah, Gina and Amanda so. were getting. <laughs> They were being abused. It was all these terrible things. But in interviews, everybody says, you know, Gina and Amanda say that um, Michelle got it the worst of all of them. That's so weird. Mm -hmm. Once a child was in the picture, the home's entire dynamic changed. Castro actually bonded with the child, and once she was two, would begin to take her out of the house to play at parks. What? Yeah. What would he tell people? Does it remind you of the movie, um... What is that movie where they're stuck in, like, a basement? The Room or something? The Room, yeah. It reminds me of the, the movie The Room. You guys haven't seen that. It's... It's, it's a really good movie. Yeah, I want to say it's really it's good, but also it's it. really sad. Um, this, woman, this woman is abducted when she was a teenager, and then she ends up having a kid who grows up literally living in a room, not knowing what it looks like outside of window. Literally, like, the same thing. <laughs> yeah, the exact same thing. Um, but the daughter, Jocelyn, actually, when she was two, he would start taking her out to parks. That's gonna be so weird growing up like that and just thinking like this is normal. Yeah, Mom, she thought it was Mom, normal. Chained up in her room. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Um, if any of the neighbors asked or anybody really asked who was familiar with him, he would just tell them it was his girlfriend's child. Oh. Amanda made sure to homeschool Jocelyn because she didn't really want her to fall behind in school, and she Aww. she knew like she wanted to. She had that maternal instinct. She wanted her to get the most out of it she possibly could. Given her situation. I'm probably hoping that she would get out someday mm-hmm. and she wouldn't be super far behind. Yeah, exactly. So in 2013, just months before the women's escape, Castro showed his older daughter a picture of Jocelyn under the same disguise that it was his girlfriend's daughter and asked her, isn't she cute? And then her older daughter responded that it looked like one of their younger siblings, like it looked like her younger sister and asked if she it asked her dad if he was sure it wasn't his daughter. Oh and he's like, no, God. he's like, no, it's literally my girlfriend's That's daughter. Weird. Yeah, and I still don't think um, Castro's older daughter. I don't think he she was suspicious even at this point. She's like, oh, that's that's even pretty weird. Even if she weird. was suspicious, she'd just be like, my dad's lying about getting this. Yeah, girlfriend. exactly, <laughs> so. exactly. So on May 6, thousand thirteen, Jocelyn, now age six, was able to go downstairs and run back up to tell her mom, Amanda, quote, I don't find daddy. Daddy's nowhere around. Daddy's car is gone. And it also made me wonder, like, I wasn't sure exactly how much privileges his daughter Jocelyn would ha- have around the, the house. I know she wasn't, like, shackled up, and he wanted her to feel, like, pretty normal. So it kind of made it seem like she was able to walk around the house freely. Yeah. She just couldn't leave. But even if she did want to leave, like, she didn't think anything was really wrong with her situations. I want to assume because Amanda, her mom, didn't want to tell her, like, yeah. tell her yeah, how right. horrible it was. She wanted to normalize it. Exactly. Um, but obviously, when Jocelyn came in and said, Daddy's car is gone, um, Amanda kind of got a fight or flight instinct, which is... The mama, mama bear came out. The mama bear came out. So, miraculously, for the first time in ten years, Amanda found her bedroom door unlocked while Castro was Ooh, out of the house. That is some great timing. Yep, <laughs> and she knew it probably would be her only chance ever. It was now or never. Um, so she was determined to fucking try to escape. And also, luckily, downstairs, the front door was open, but it was wired with an alarm, and beyond, like, the open door, there was a, um, like, a storm door that was padlocked shut. So pretty much, like, imagine the door was open, but there was, like, another door on it, in a way. 
you just kind of see pictures. Like yeah. I was imagining like a screen door, but metal. <laughs> I think that's what it was. It was well, like kind of like, like a screen. Like it's a gate, mm-hmm. and then oh, it's like yeah. another door. Like it's hard to door. it's hard to break in, but he obviously didn't expect her to be able to walk out of the house, or to walk out of her room. I mean. Mm-hmm. And luckily, Amanda was able to somehow squeeze an arm out. She couldn't open it all the way. Obviously, it's pretty tough to get through. And she began screaming and waving her arms, begging somebody to help, saying, I'm Amanda Berry. Please send help. And at this time, you know, it had been 10 years since she went missing, but... They're in, like, who's in, Amanda Berry? No, no. In, in Cleveland, like, everyone still knew her name. Like, everybody knew <gasps> oh, her shit, name. Like, that's lucky. It was a huge deal. So. Unfortunately, if it was Michelle, they would have been like, who? Yeah, exactly. That's sad. So a next door neighbor, Charles Ramsey, recalled hearing her screams. Quote, I heard screaming. I was eating my McDonald's. I come outside and I see (laughs) this girl going nuts trying to get out of the house. He proceeded to kick the door in and let Amanda out to safety before they called 911. And this is like a very, this kind of became a meme, just kind of, you might have seen on YouTube um, from a few years ago. But he said, quote, I knew something was wrong when a pretty little white girl ran into a black man's arms. Dead giveaway. (laughs) <laughs> Which I'll show you guys the video later because it's okay. very wholesome. Um, and then after that, the police soon arrived on the scene where they were told to go inside, where they found Michelle and Gina still locked up. And, and they I were was able like, to Michelle and Gina, her is happening. Like, the fuck is so, going on? So, Michelle and Gina, I think they knew that they could have escaped, but I, th- I, I think I, I um, listened to something that said that Michelle was about to like run out too, but Gina was telling her, like, no, don't. Like, she was. They might have a trap. Yeah, exactly. Like he was tricking them. Mm-hmm. Maybe test their loyalty or something. Mm-hmm. So on August 1st, 2013, Castro was sentenced to life plus 1,000 years in prison after he pled guilty to 937 counts of kidnapping, oh. rape, and aggravated murder. Holy moly. And unfortunately, um, just like Michelle's... Wait, did you say aggravated murder? Michelle's babies. Oh. Um, well, it says aggravated murder. I mean, that's what I saw on the oh, Wikipedia page. Okay, so it's probably page. forcing her to miscarry. Perhaps. Yeah. I'm not really sure. I didn't really think that hard into it. Beat. Her until she mm-hmm. yeah, lost a child. Maybe it was attempted. It could have been attempted murder. Okay. Anyway. Um, I, like, I think it's both. Yeah. I don't a little know. bit of everything mixed into this truck. Um, yeah. <laughs> you fucking... 900, though? Fuck yeah. I mean, it was, it was 9 to 11 years for these girls, so Oof. imagine how many times. Um, but unfortunately... Um, he was found dead in his prison cell after committing suicide by hanging on September 3rd, 2013. Little Pussy. bitch. No, me and Brandy. Yeah. Know. And just to put it in perspective, he was arrested on August 1st. So literally a month and two days later, he, oh my God. he killed himself. Like, he couldn't. Couldn't handle it? He couldn't handle it. And I, I, they handled yeah. it for decades. Yeah, I guarantee he was fucking getting it in prison, dude. He was probably getting his ass kicked every day. Good. He should have, <laughs> he should have jailed it for longer after what he put the girls through. 12 years to equal their thing. For real. So, since our escape, Amanda has focused her attention on organizations for missing persons and continues to raise her daughter, Jocelyn. Michelle is now remarried and actually changed her name to Lillian as a fresh start. Hmm. I mean, obviously, her name, Michelle, it has so many bad meanings associated to it. She grew up being abused, sexually abused, um, and then she was... Abused some more. Yeah, abused some more <laughs> for 10 years, not able to leave one fucking house. Um... And she actually went on to write a book called Finding Me that became a New York Times bestseller. I feel like I've heard of that book. And um, the saddest thing, though, that she actually was never able to reunite with her son, Joey. Um, I'm not sure what it is now. He's probably 18 by now. But at the time, his adoptive parents wouldn't allow it. They don't want to confuse him. And she kind of was respecting of that. And I watched an interview that she was saying that she just prays that when he's 18, he'll try to reach reach out out to her. That's Mm kind of fucked. Because she can't help that situation. Yeah. Yeah. And they wouldn't have to tell him, like, who she, They could even lie and be like, this is a family friend. Yeah. I know. That's but fucked up. It, it could have been confusing for him. If you're like, listening to me, parents who adopted Joey, that was kind of mean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty sad. And then Gina has since joined forces with the Northeast Ohio Amber Alert Committee and lives a quiet life in Cleveland. Hmm. And then in 2015, Amanda and Gina released a book called Hope. A memoir of survival in Cleveland, recounting their time in captivity. Well, they co-wrote it? Mm-hmm. That's they wrote cool. it together. Um, and also, I wanted to point out, too, I... So, when Michelle got... So, they were all in the hospital together, and a lot of the nurses were saying that once they were separated in rooms, the girls would just, like, try to walk out of the rooms and try to find each other to be next to each other. Aww. And um, once Gina and Michelle and Amanda, once they all finally were able to leave the hospital, 
Oh, I should also mention, too, that Michelle wasn't able to leave the hospital for a few weeks because her condition, she was, like, close to dead. Holy shit. Yeah, I didn't mention that. She was close to dead, um, so she was there the longest, but when she finally got out of the hospital last, she had no family waiting on her. Um, her family only, like, kind of briefly reappeared for interviews, and then she wanted no part. She never saw her family. Like, they tried visiting the hospital, and she, hospital, and she told the staff, like, don't let them come see yeah, me. Yeah, she's like, fuck them. They didn't even look for me, and they were abusive Yeah, anyway. exactly. That, I think that's also a reason she changed her name. She also changed her last name. Um, but I think I, I read that she ended up staying with Gina for a few days after to just Aww. be around her family. Yeah, and it was, um, if you watch on YouTube, they, they did, like, parades and stuff. All right. I want to say, like, a block party more so when the girls had come home. Like, Amanda came home, and then Gina came home. And it's super emotional if you guys watch it. Um, yeah, it almost made me tear up to see, like, the girls, like, to see Gina with her mom, like, covering her. Gina had, like, a hoodie on. And, like, everyone's just, like, cheering. It was super, it was really emotional. Oh. Yeah, that's a, it, like, felt hopeful, but also, like, sad at the same time. They but, just lost a decade yeah, of their lives. Yeah, just 10 out of 10 hit the feels. But, yeah, so <laughs> that is um, the Cleveland kidnapping survivors their story is really recent actually so i actually remember when all this went down it's fucking oh, yeah, I crazy remember too. yeah i can remember in the news for a while yeah but yeah okay sad shit <laughs> but it's not as at least all these people were able to escape and it seems like a lot of them were able to turn their life around and you know get the most out of it it's so interesting to think about how anytime people will survive something whether it be you know like a murder or an abductor or a surviving like say like even like a shark attack like they'll end up doing great things yeah they, they use their trauma and then fuel it into motivation and then end up doing amazing things it's kind of crazy that's good yeah it's good it's i guess it's one way of coping <laughs> yeah other than that sorry about the darkness this week everyone <laughs> and every other week yeah and most weeks. I could have a couple lighthearted ones. I mean, we are ish. We are like a true crime ghost podcast, and ghosts are for once people who died. So. I know. It's funny. We were talking about. The fuck? That was a weird sounding car. We were talking about earlier how Brandy and Leah like the true crime stuff more, and I like the ghost stuff. And I was like, oh, because it's not as dark. And then I was like, well, I guess they all died at some point, too. Yeah. Especially when I did the haunted castle, and I was like, the trap door that led to spikes yeah. when they <laughs> fell. But it's just ghosts, it's fine. <laughs> but yeah, um, anyway, if you want to email us any ideas, comments, criticisms, any personal stories that you want us to tell, our email is talesfromyondpodcast at gmail.com. Our website is talesfromthebeyondpodcast.com. I'm sure. You're making me think <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> our Instagram is talesfromyondpodcast. Our Twitter is spooky underscore beyond. Thank you guys for listening, and catch you on the flippity flip. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.